Well, this evening, let's uh, look at this last section of Psalm 119, and then let's again try to see this connection between obedience and blessing and understanding that connection, how we should respond then to God's law and towards the idea of obedience. Uh, Psalm 119, verses 169 through 176. The psalmist writes this, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Let my lips utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. Let my tongue sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live that it may praise you, and let your ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, this morning we did see that uh, Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior that God has provided, which means that you must trust in Him if you are to be saved. But we also saw that He did come into the world for a particular purpose, and that purpose was that He might be King over all creation. He is the Lord, which means that you not only need to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus to be saved, but if you are saved... You will submit to Him because He is the King. He is actually your King. But we've also been reminded by this psalm, as well as the study that we had on Wednesday evening, of the connection that exists between obedience and blessing. The Bible says that, and you might say that this is another incentive which the Lord gives to us uh, uh, in order to obey Him, that if you submit to this King that He will bless you. And again, we're going to see uh, portions this evening of some of the things we saw on Wednesday evening. Those blessings are lavish. Those blessings are great. They are things I hope you want. I think all of us do want them. We just need to understand how we get them. If you submit to this King, He will bless you. But if you don't, what He will do uh, depends on your relationship with Him. If you don't know Him, He will bring judgment on you. I mean, that's the reason why people suffer uh, in the world and why people suffer in hell is when they don't submit to this king, they have to suffer for their crimes against him because it is a crime not to submit to him. But as we were reminded on Wednesday evening, even if the Lord doesn't punish those who don't submit to him in this life, he will in that life to come. But now as Christians, we don't escape this altogether either because if you do know Him and you don't submit to Him, the Lord will still deal with you, but thankfully He'll deal with you as a father to a child. He will discipline you until you obey because it is good. Now, He does this because He is the King, and as a King, He rightly demands that you obey Him. But again, if you are yours, if you belong to Him, it's also because He loves you. And He cares for you, and He knows that obedience is good for you. He knows that sin will injure you, that sin can destroy you, but for His grace. So He will do what is necessary to get you out of your sin. Now, with this in mind, let's take a look at this last section of this psalm to get one final glimpse at the heart of the psalmist. And what I want you to see is is basically this, that the psalmist, understanding all of these things, not only wanted to be obedient to the Lord, but he wanted to be as obedient as he possibly could be because he understood many things, but not the least of which obedience leads to blessing. So again, I I suppose what we would want to say by this is, is simply this, that we don't want to just squeak by. We don't want to just do, as it were, the bare minimum so we can still convince ourselves that we belong to the Lord and maybe receive some of His blessings. 
But the goal is to be as obedient as we possibly can, to, to be as much like Jesus as we possibly can, to receive as much of God's blessing as we possibly can, so that we might be as useful to the Lord as we possibly can, and not only honor Him in this life, but receive honor from Him in that life which is coming. So we're going to look at um, a few things in that regard this evening. Now, the first thing that I believe the psalmist points us to, again, is that there is a connection between obedience and blessing. And I think we see that in his uh, two opening petitions to the Lord, two opening requests. First, that he might understand God's word better. And secondly, that the Lord might deliver him according to his promise in verses 169 and 170. He says, let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Now, first, the psalmist wanted to understand God's word better. And I think we should assume from the whole thrust of the psalm that he was referring particularly to God's law. And why is it that he wanted to understand the law better? It's because he understood the connection between obedience and blessing. And I would just again remind those of you who are at the Wednesday study that this is one of the things that Spurgeon was also reminding us of. Obedience leads to blessing, disobedience to judgment or to discipline. Now here, let me just review just some short snippets of what we saw on Wednesday evening. First of all, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Uh, Moses wrote this, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Now again, he goes on and on with regard to the blessings, but I wanted us again to get at least that much of it back into our minds. Now more to the concern of the psalmist who appears to have been under attack by some enemy, we read in Leviticus 26, which is actually the portion Spurgeon was drawing our attention to, in verses 6 through 8. If you obey me, I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. If you obey the Lord, the Lord will bless you. He will keep you safe. He will give you victory in warfare. But what happens if you disobey? Well, he continues in Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 17, but... If you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you, so that you will be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. Now, which do you want? <laughs> blessings or the curse? Well, obviously, the psalmist wanted the blessings. That's wise. The psalmist was under some kind of attack, as I've said, and so very naturally he looks to the Lord to help him understand his law better so that he might do it, so that he might receive the blessing of deliverance from his enemies. Now, what should you do 
when you're faced with difficulties? First of all, you should ask yourself whether these difficulties have come from God because you're not obeying Him, whether the Lord is disciplining you. Now, that's not always the reason why they come. Sometimes the Lord simply wants to teach you to walk more closely with Him, and when He brings difficulty, that pushes you towards Him. But sometimes it is because of an unwillingness on your part, on my part, to listen to Him. Now, if you are His child and you disobey Him and you dishonor Him, He will discipline you and He often does it through difficult circumstances so that you will turn from your sin and begin to do the right thing again. God's not going to bless you for disobeying Him. He's only going to bless you for obeying Him, doing the right thing. But whether the Lord is simply teaching you to walk more closely with Him or whether He's disciplining you for some sin, your response should be the same, the response of the psalmist. Help me, Lord, to understand Your will. Help me to do it. Help me to walk more closely with You. I think we would all admit that we need to walk more closely with the Lord than we do. Certainly, if you have God's Spirit in you, that's what you want to do. So again, there's a connection between obedience and blessing. Now second, because obedience leads to blessing, you should thank the Lord that He has actually revealed His law to you, that you should thank Him for what He's already taught you out of His law. That's what the psalmist does in the next two verses, verses 171 and 172. He says, let my lips utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. Let my tongue sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Now, understand what a blessing it is to have God's law, to have His word, to have everything, law and gospel, of course. Not everybody knows exactly what it is that God wants. Now, it is true that God has given to everyone an internal voice that is called conscience, and that conscience helps you to understand something of what God requires. When you do something that's wrong, conscience convicts you and helps you feel something of, of the guilt of that, that you've disobeyed God, you've dishonored Him in some way. But the voice of conscience is not as clear as the law which the Lord has given to you in His Word. It's not as clear as His written revelation. Now listen to what Moses said to Israel and contrast it with what he says is true of the other nations, what's true of Israel because they have the law versus other nations. If conscience, which is in every man, was as clear as the law, Moses wouldn't be able to say this. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, he's, and again, this is meant to give us a greater appreciation for what God has given to us by telling us what He wants us to do so that we can receive His blessing. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor, for all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law? which I am setting before you today. You see, Israel was set apart from all the other nations of the earth in this one particular area, as well as others. God had given them His law. They knew what He wanted. 
they knew how to please him. And every single one of them who actually did, God protected, God preserved, and of course, we know what he did to those who didn't, which is why the psalmist thanked God that he had given him this treasure. He blessed him and praised him for it. Now, if it's true that God blesses those who keep His law, then aren't you blessed if you know what it is that God wants? Do you praise God and thank Him that He has revealed these things to you? You see, that, that is the heart of one who truly understands the blessing that God has imparted. But of course, more importantly, do you do what it is that the Lord has called you to do? Because the law is only a blessing if you actually keep it, if you know what God wants you to do, but you don't do it, then you only become more blamable when you disobey Him. Now listen to what Jesus says in Luke 12, verses 47 through 48 with regard to one's level of culpability uh, for doing things that are wrong according to what one knows. Jesus said, and that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will, will receive many lashes, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more." It's a great blessing to have God's law, to have the revelation of what it is that's pleasing to Him. But if you have it and you know what He wants you to do and you don't do it, well, then that actually works against you. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus meant when He said to His disciples as He sent them out to preach His word in all the towns and villages in Israel, He said this, whoever does not receive you nor listen to your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet, truly I say to you it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, the people in those towns and cities, at least in our, you know, on, on the surface, didn't seem to commit sins as serious as Sodom and Gomorrah, but yet the fact that, that they were given God's word and they rejected it, that was a, a more serious crime in God's eyes than even those horrible sexual sins committed by Sodom and Gomorrah. So you should thank God that He has revealed His will to you, His law to you, but you should also, having it, do your best to keep it by the grace of God. Okay. So there is a connection between, obviously, those two things, but again, the blessings only come if you obey him. You should thank the Lord for those mercies, but make sure that you do what you know is God's will. Now, thirdly, if you do obey, then you can expect, obviously, that God's going to bless you. And I, it just occurs to me that this is faith's checkbook, isn't it? This is where you take the check to the bank, as it were, the bank of heaven. You say, here's the draft. This is what God has promised. And so, I've met the condition, so give me what was promised. Well, if you obey God then you can know that God will give you what He has promised. And that's exactly what the psalmist tells us that he was expecting God to do for him in verses 173 and 174. He says, let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and we would say he also expect it, and your law is my delight. Now, he anticipated that God was going to help him because he had met the conditions of his help. He delighted in his law. He chose obedience over disobedience. You see, you can't have the blessings without meeting the conditions. But when you do meet the conditions, again, by God's grace, you can have every expectation that the Lord will meet you with his blessings. <clears throat> now, one question that uh, I'm not sure that we've actually asked, but perhaps we should address is this. Um, maybe you've wondered whether those promises made to Old Covenant Israel actually still apply today. Will God still bless you if you obey Him? 
But let me just say there's no reason to believe that God has really changed in this regard. There's certainly nothing in Scripture that would lead us to that conclusion or that the blessings that God has to give us are purely spiritual, you know, confined to the spiritual realm. By the way, if they were simply confined to the spiritual realm, that would still be far greater than anything that we deserve because those are the most precious blessings that He has to give. But I don't think those are the only blessings that God has promised to give us. I mean, for one thing, the example that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things that you need, food and covering, which are physical blessings, will be given to you. There's one example. But another example we find in the book of Ephesians, where Paul is reminding the children who are in that church of one of the greatest blessings that God promises if they will keep the fifth commandment. Listen to what he says in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now, I want you to notice that, that this promise was originally spoken to God's old covenant people, and yet Paul tells us it clearly still applies to the new covenant church. Now, there's no reason to doubt that all of them continue. At least, you know, again, we have to extract some of these things from the land because we no longer live in the land. It's not that God's going to give us the land of Israel. But there are many other promises that the Lord has given to us that are contingent upon obedience that He will give to us. But just from this one commandment alone, ask yourself this question. Do you want to live long in this world? And in a long life or with a long life, would you like things to go well with you? Um, do you want them to go well in the world which is coming? Honor your father and your mother. Obey your parents. God says if you do that, then you will have a long life and it will be well with you. If you obey God's commandments, you can expect God's blessings. Now finally, knowing that there is a connection between blessing and obedience, one thing you should never be content with is your current level of obedience. The psalmist prayed that the Lord would help him on account of all these things, not just this, but everything that he's written thus far, that God would help him obey better than he had been obeying before. The last two verses, he says this, let my soul live that it may praise you and let your ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. You know, the last thing I would expect the psalmist to say are those words in those last verses, especially I've gone astray like a lost sheep because he's been pleading his obedience throughout the entire psalm. What, what could he possibly mean by that? Well, I think what he meant was this, that in spite of all his best efforts to, to serve the Lord and to obey the Lord and to conform as closely as he could to his law, he was still aware of the fact that he was falling short. Now, he hadn't gone completely off the rails. I, I think we understand that because throughout this psalm, we've seen that, that he delighted in God's law and sought to keep it and expected that God would deliver him on that basis. And yet, he still believed that he didn't measure up. He was asking that the Lord would, would seek him like a lost sheep uh, from strain and would bring him back in order that he might be more obedient. Now, I think what the psalmist is saying is basically this, that no matter how well you think you're obeying the Lord or how well you really are obeying the Lord, you never really can obey Him well enough. I mean, Jesus told His disciples uh, on one occasion this, which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to Him when He has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. 
We have done only that which we ought to have done. Now, what Jesus meant by that is even when you've done everything that God requires of you, you still need to see yourself as an unprofitable servant because you've only done your duty. But how much more is this true when you haven't done all your duty, which is the case with each one of us here? Even Paul, toward the end of his life, when he had reached what we would assume to be the very pinnacle of his sanctification and Christ's likeness, still considered himself to be the greatest of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. If he had said, I was, then we might assume that Paul was reflecting on his past and saying, I know I'm a persecutor of the church, tried to destroy it, God had mercy on me and so forth, and, and we know that that is true. But he uses the word, the present tense, I am, foremost of all. He still saw himself as the greatest of sinners. And I think that tells us something about the work of sanctification, doesn't it? Because the closer we get to God, and actually the more we grow into his likeness, the more we become aware of our shortcomings. It's kind of like, um, I think I told you about John Frame's um, uh, diagram that he gave to um, uh, one of his classes where he, he draws a circle and he says, this is your knowledge, okay? Um, this is how much you know, this little circle right here. Well, when you only know a little, you're only aware of, of you know, just a little bit that you don't know, where your knowledge comes in contact with the things you don't know. But as your knowledge expands, it comes in contact with more knowledge, and the more you learn, the more you understand you don't know. So when you only know a little bit, you think you know a lot, and when you know a lot, you realize how little you know. Well, the same thing is true with regard to righteousness, isn't it? When you think you know what God requires and your knowledge is only small, you think you've, have, you've had it made. I mean, you, you're like Jesus. There was a time in, in my foolishness where I thought, oh, it wouldn't be that hard to live like Jesus, you know, to be just like Him. And, and yet, the more I learn, the more I realize how difficult it is and impossible. Even with the grace of God, we cannot become exactly like Him. And we won't until we, we leave this world. Well, the Apostle Paul realized that, and the holier he became, the more like Jesus he became, the more he understood, the more he realized how far short he fell, the more he realized that he was the greatest of sinners. So you and I are never going to arrive while we're in this world. There's always going to be room then for improvement. Uh, we read in Philippians chapter 3 that Paul didn't think that he had made it, but he continued to press forward to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ had laid hold of him. And he encouraged the Philippians to do the same. And the Lord is telling us that's what we need to do. This is the kind of attitude the Lord wants you to have. He wants you to strive for perfection. Your goal shouldn't be, as I said before, just to try to get away as much, with as much as you can and still make it to heaven but to see how closely you can walk with the Lord, how closely you can resemble Him, how useful you can be to Him in, in this life before you leave this world. That is the goal of the Christian life. Now, again, because the Spirit lives in your hearts, this is what you should desire to do. But Jonathan Edwards reminds us that even if there were no blessings for obedience, because the Spirit is in our hearts, we would still do it, even if there were no connection between blessing and obedience. Because the Spirit of God is in you and gives you that desire. But how much more should we want to obey the Lord when He has not only given us the desire, but also has put this incentive in front of us? If you obey me, I will bless you every way you turn. Everything you put your hands to will prosper. Well, understanding all of these things in closing, let me just remind you briefly how you can be more obedient. Now, this is assuming that you're a believer, because if you're not a believer, you can't do what the Lord calls you to do, and nothing you do is going to be pleasing to Him at all, because you have no love in your heart for Him, no desire to give Him glory. If you're not a believer, you need to trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. You must first be born again. You must first be a believer 
before you can do this. But if you are a believer, this is how you can strengthen your obedience. First of all, you need to be convinced that this is what the Lord desires of you. This is what He calls you to do, what He calls you to be, to be like Jesus. Now, I don't think the Lord could have made it any or could have said it any more plainly than what He says in Matthew 5, 48. Okay, listen, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is the goal. Do you need any more convincing? Okay. You need to know that's the goal, okay? If you're going to be obedient, first of all, understand that's the goal. Secondly, you, do, you need to understand that obedience is important, okay? It's important to obey. I hope that this psalm tells you that it is, the entirety of the psalm. I hope those portions we read from Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 will convince you, if that doesn't, the study that we had on Wednesday night. So it's important that you obey. Third... You have to want to obey before you're going to obey. But the Lord has already taken care of that problem, hasn't He? he he's given you His Holy Spirit so that you would obey. The reason why you weren't obeying is because you didn't have the Spirit, because there was nothing good in you. But God has now given you the Spirit so that the law would be fulfilled in you. And that doesn't mean that, you know, something that's just... Uh, it's not talking about imputation. It's not talking about crediting Christ's righteousness to you, but God gives you His Spirit so that you will walk in His ways. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, that is by itself, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And if you read the rest of Romans chapter 8, you see that if you have the Spirit of God, then you are walking according to the Spirit. And if that's what you're doing, then He is fulfilling the requirement of the law in you. And what that means is that He is helping you to obey. He is giving you the ability to obey by giving you the desire to obey. So if you have the Spirit of God, you already want to obey Him. So that qualification has been met as well. However, we need to realize at the same time that, that we do have to fight against the desire not to obey because we still have sin in us. The old man, the flesh, is still present. There's still corruption. We have to deal with it. Now, if you're a believer, He's already given you the ability to fight against that too, which is why Paul writes later in Romans chapter 8, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you have the Spirit, that is what you are doing putting to death the deeds of the body. You're not living in the flesh. You're not giving yourself to your sinful desires. You are instead yielding to the Spirit of God as He leads you in the righteous commandments of the Lord. He is fulfilling the requirement of the law in you. So the pattern we should find in the Christian life is that, yes, we will sin. We're imperfect in many ways. But our desire will be for obedience, and we're going to keep moving that direction as we put to death our sins and as we, well, as the Spirit of God works the image of Christ in us. Now, if that is true, which it is, and you've already heard this this evening, fifthly, you need to use the means that God has given to you in order to strengthen the Spirit's work in you so that you'll have a stronger desire to obey and let me just remind you how to do that. Read His Word, hear it preached, seek to understand it, study it, apply it to your lives, receive it in faith, respond appropriately to it. Worship the Lord. That's why we're gathered together here this evening and why it is a blessing to be able to do that twice on the Lord's Day because this is a means by which we get more of the Spirit of God, more of His influence, more of His help. Pray and ask the Lord for more of His help. Participate in the Lord's Supper. 
frequently. It's one of the reasons why we have it frequently is because it is one of the ways God builds us up in His Holy Spirit. Fellowship with believers. Build relationships with those who want to obey the Lord. And break off your relationships with those who don't want to obey the Lord because they will weaken you. They will tempt you to sin. Bad company corrupts good morals. Build relationships with those who love the Lord and want to obey Him. Break off relationships with those who don't. And then finally, when all is said and done, you need to obey. <laughs> you need to obey the Lord. Every one of us every day is faced with choices, many choices throughout the day, choices between doing what is right and doing what is wrong in every choice. There's only one right choice usually and maybe many wrong choices, but there are choices and you need to make the right choices. You need to yield to the Lord, to do what the Lord wants you to do and not to do what He tells you not to do. In other words, you need to do the right thing. It's interesting that there are many who follow Jesus who weren't willing, you know, that, who called Him Lord but weren't willing to submit to Him. And Jesus says to them in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Well, that's just hypocrisy, isn't it? If He is the Lord, then we need to obey Him. You really can't call Him Lord if you don't obey Him. So again, understanding all of these things, it really boils down to whether or not we're actually going to yield to God, whether we're going to uh, allow the Spirit of God to lead us in the right path and whether we're actually going to listen to Him and submit to Him. Submit to what Jesus Christ tells us to do because ultimately it doesn't matter how much we, we know, as I said, it's going to speak against us unless we actually obey. What really matters is how much we do of what we know as to how much of God's blessing we're going to receive or how much discipline we're going to receive or if we don't know Him at all, how much judgment we're going to receive. It boils down to whether or not we are going to yield to Him and submit to Him as Lord. So may the Lord give to each of us grace. We need His grace to do this, not only to know more of His will, but to do it by His grace and by His Spirit that we might be more useful to Him and that we might also receive more of His blessings in this life and in that life which is coming. May the Lord take all that we've seen here and give to us a higher appreciation for His ways and the desire by His Spirit uh, to walk in it. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would... Um, Help us to do that.